Good afternoon, everyone. Can everyone please take their seats so we can start? Uh, welcome. My name is Vanessa Grillet. I'm an executive director at Consensus, uh, where I co-founded the Blockchain for Social Impact. I'm happy to welcome you at this conference and at this panel where we have five. All righty. So I'm William Michael Cunningham. I run a company called Creative Investment Research. So our thesis is a little different. Our thesis is that none of this shit works, all right? Uh, from the standpoint of being a black person in the United States of America, economics does not work. It actually works very well. When you see companies polluting, it's because inputs are free. So the economic models say that you should overutilize those resources in order to maximize profits. So according to economic theory, everything is going fine. When you see slavery, the reason why slavery has increased so dramatically over the past 20 years is because of the ascendancy of free market economics, which says that you should maximize profit by using any resource you can get your hands on, especially if it's free. And because of the decline in the power of governments, which was also a, a key point point of Chicago economics, getting rid of government, right? Because governments are no longer effective, it means that we can increase our utilization of these free resources. So what we do is we create investment vehicles that are honest, actually. What do I mean by that? So 1992, we created a mortgage-backed security originated by loans from black-owned banks. The idea is to get mortgage credit into black communities. Worked like a charm. We did that for the Lutheran Church Pension Fund, socially responsible investor, institutional, looking for a way to invest, have high social impact in a way that's what is called ERISA compliant. Fast forward, 1996, I get this call from Bear Stearns. Bear Stearns says, you know, one of the things we do is we look at every mortgage-backed security that's ever been created. And your mortgage-backed security was at the top of the performance profile. We would like to create a mortgage-backed security like that, but we'd like to do it for about $200 million. So I said, and this is the key point, I said, well, the only way to do that is if you lower underwriting standards. Not thinking that they would do that, you know? <laughs> because the other thing I said was, if you do that, you're gonna destroy yourself, okay? You're basically going to hide value in the marketplace. They did that that created the financial crisis. We had nothing to do with that part, okay? <laughs> we, just, we just created the first part. So what we're doing in, in blockchain is we have created two investment vehicles, one to deal with homelessness. We should chat uh, because once again, uh, part of the issue is you gotta understand needs are independent from identity. To the extent that you guys get caught up on identity, you're playing into the hands of large financial institutions who are not going to solve the frickin' problem. If they were gonna solve the problem, they would have done so already, okay? So I'm here to say, push out independently on the things that you're doing. Use Ethereum, use Bitcoin. There's nothing wrong with Bitcoin, nothing. The only thing that's wrong with it is that it disintermediates uh, uh, large financial institutions, and I'll talk about a paper from, uh, am I taking up too much time? I'll talk about a paper from, <laughs> the, the, there's a paper from the Central Bank of Brazil, which you should look up. It's called Distributed Ledger Technical Research in the Central Bank of Brazil. And they go over all of the reasons why central banks should not use DLT, distributed ledger technology. What you get when you read this paper is you come to realize the reason they're against it is because it disintermediates them. You know, I can get money to a refugee in Syria using Bitcoin today, today, if I can structure the right delivery mechanism. And I know I can. Um, uh, you know, actually, there was one company, what's that company that has the phones? The cell phones that you were told, Robert, that you were, that were they're going to distribute cell phones to underserved individuals that have a token on it. What? So they've got like five million phones, okay? I get some of those phones. I go to Southeast Washington, D.C., black community. I'm telling you, I could actually significantly impact the economic profile of that community. So it's a matter of time. Don't get caught up in all of this, you know, permission ledger stuff. You know, use the hardcore stuff. 
Uh, it, that's all you need. That's all you need. All right. <laughs> But I'll, I'll use it anyway. So the, what's special about blockchain is trust. The issue in the financial marketplace has been the complete lack of trust. The financial crisis was caused by a defined set of financial institutions, Wells Fargo, JP Morgan, Goldman Sachs, Standard & Poor's, none of whom paid any kind of price for causing a $17 trillion loss, imposing a $17 trillion loss on the U.S. economy. Nobody got fired. No, one guy, and I think it was a black guy, went to jail, right? It, <laughs> I think it was, it, it's always a brother, for the, for the LIBOR thing in uh, England. One guy went to jail. That is crazy. What that means is that you cannot trust the financial institutions to look out for your interests. And government is so weak, government has been so weakened that the government can't step in and do what it was supposed to do, which is to reinforce and enforce that trust. So with things like the, the Ethereum, Bitcoin, blockchain, trust is embedded in the system. That's why it is so, that's why it's taken off. Now, the last thing I'll say, there's a guy named Sai Lau. Was that the guy's name I, I gave uh, 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 Robert? The guy from Tencent? Yeah, Sai Lau. Sai Lau gave a talk. He's an executive vice president of a firm called Tencent, which is a big internet company in China. He gave a talk yesterday at the IMF Statistical Forum where he really outlined the use case for these technologies. What he said was this. He said, you know, neoclassical economic models are based on maximization of profits. That is wrong. What we have to do is we have to change our thinking so that we develop economic models that are based on maximization of human welfare for everybody. And here's the other issue. The, the neoclassical economic models, again, work for a very defined set of population. I'm talking you Europeans, okay? Uh, basically, what we've got to do is we, what we're seeing is we're seeing a need to expand that out to all of the populations of, uh, of the world. And that's where blockchain comes in. That's actually, that's why it's so important. So the question is about risk. The key risk for us is that the social return will not be met. Uh, and in order to evaluate that, we developed a, a way to calculate financial and social return back in 1989. We call it the fully adjusted return methodology. So we use that to kind of calculate what the projected social and financial return uh, would be. Now, a couple of things that go into that. We don't believe in scale. Nobody ever created a maximally impactful product or vehicle by thinking about meeting some timetable from some venture capitalist. The alphabet was not invented, or the, num the number system, right? There was no venture capitalist who came along and said, oh, you know what, we need a number system. You know, I'll give you a million dollars. True innovation happens in a way that is independent of monetary returns. True, I mean, I mean the b alphabet, n number system. So we keep that top of mind when we're creating these types of investment vehicles. The other thing that we look at is for maximum disintermediation. We want to disintermediate charities with respect to homelessness. Charities are like giving a man who's dying of thirst water with an eyedropper. You know, it's not enough. It's, the, the needs are huge. And you're coming in with these private, these little private institutions, you know, that are dropping a couple of drops here and there. You're never going to solve the problem that way. But we do think that there's a way to combine uh, private sector along with government, along with nonprofits, to have a much bigger impact. And we see blockchain as a tool for keeping track of the actual performance. That's the key. The key is disaggregated, honest, trustworthy, performance reporting, because we know the issue is, if you're focused on the money, you're going to cheat on the reporting. Uh, uh, Volkswagen did it. Standard & Poor's did it. You know, it just, it's kind of a natural thing. So you have to look for another system that will give you a true recognition of the social return. I, and this is where, where we think blockchain can help. Awesome. I know we got limited time. So uh, Coinbase. Uh, we worked with... Uh, a lady named Cookie Miller in Washington, D.C. She has a group of 400 African-American hair salon owners. And we went in in April and we told them to buy Bitcoin. It was 1,200 bucks, right? Went to a meeting, said, look, put 100 bucks in, go to Coinbase, sign up with an account. About 20% of them did it. I'm the man now. 
at that group, all right? I am the man. You know, I go back in there, people, not all of them held on to it, right? Because, you know, being a black female, raising a family, you, you need that money. But some of them did, and their $100 is now worth $600. Huge impact on uh, uh, African-American family. The other thing is coin score, coin score, illuminate, uh, uh, Robert, stand up. Robert's group runs uh, uh, a scoring mechanism for ICOs. We're talking to them about adding a social return component to that. Right now it's financial return. And then lastly, Ian Bellina. Ian, I-A-N-B-A-L-I-N-A. -A -A. Ian Bellina, di at Diary of a Made Man. This is a brother out of uh, IBM. He quit his IBM job uh, to basically go full-time into ICO. He's got an ICO portfolio that he runs online. And you can basically see what he's done. And his uh, performance is outstanding. So if I were looking at ICOs, CoinScore, Ian Bellina, if I hadn't gotten involved at all, go to Coinbase and put some money into uh, uh, Bitcoin, Ethereum, uh, you know, just so you can see how it works. Gave an okay, um, investment. So, uh, you know, I mentioned the the mortgage-backed security, uh, black-owned banks uh, worked very well. They had the unfortunate uh, uh, characteristic of starting uh, subprime lending, but that again, we had nothing to do with that. Uh, we also worked on something called the microcredit stock exchange back in 2006. Now, microcredit. Everybody knows microcredit. Everybody knows stock exchange. Just put the two together. What that is is crowdfunding. So that was one of the first implementations of uh, uh, crowdfunding. We took it to the mayor of DC. He had no clue. Because <laughs> we wanted to put this microcredit stock exchange up in Anacostia, a black, poor black neighborhood in Washington DC. We said, hey, let these businesses, you know, trade stock for your little business on the, on the court. No clue, but he did pass it on to some guys in New York. Next thing you know, you know, crowdfunding. Uh, the other thing that, that we're happy about, the other investment, Cookie Miller, Cookie Miller. Being able to go out to, and there weren't 400 African-American hair salon owners there. I think it was probably about 100 or so, you know? But it was a significant crowd. And going, being able to go in and tell them, hey, do this. Do this today. Here's the website that you go to. Put 100 bucks in. And having that work out so well from April to November, no clue that it would perform that well. None. I can't take credit for that. But it was a nice feeling to be able to do that. Okay, thank you very much. We're gonna have to end this uh, wonderful panel and I wanna thank our panelists um, for their contributions. Thank you.